In this video, which has been sponsored by The Great Courses Plus, but more of that later, I'm going to talk to you about one of the bloodiest days in history, probably the bloodiest day in Roman history, and a strong contender for the bloodiest day in the history of any civilization ever. This was the Battle of Cannae, and it took place in August 216 BC during the Second Punic War. Some of you will need a little bit of backstory. So, the story so far. There was a general called Hamilcar Barca, and he fought for the big, long-established Mediterranean superpower Carthage, which is a, a city on the coast of North Africa, uh, which had great trading networks going all the way around the Mediterranean, and it was very rich and powerful, and had a largely mercenary army. And it clashed with this upcoming uh, new city uh, called Rome, which uh, is in what we today call Italy, and this, uh, they, were, they were rivals. They were rivals over the control of, for instance, Sicily, which is where Hamilcar Barca fought. And even though the Carthaginians overall lost the war, Hamilcar Barca himself was undefeated, and he was a bit annoyed being recalled by Carthage and uh, having all his support taken away from him, and he just thought, oh, those Romans, we nearly had them, we nearly had them, right, I'll get them next time. <laughs> You and what army, they laughed. Well, he did what any self-respecting general of the time would do. Uh, that is, he conquered half of Spain, got loads of silver mines, and got stinking rich. I mean, we think of Bill Gates today, don't we, as worth a bob or two. Quite a rich man, absolutely. If he wants a big yacht, he can have a big yacht. But the Barkers and other people in the ancient world got rich beyond the, 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 the possibility of imagination in the modern world. Can we imagine Bill Gates or anyone like him being so privately wealthy that he could feasibly fund a successful invasion of Russia? No. No, no one individual's that wealthy today. But the Barkers thought, Let's give it a go. Now, Hamilcar had some daughters, but we don't talk about them. Then later he had three sons. He had the eldest, Hannibal, and then Hasdrubal, and then Mago. These became commanders after his death uh, in the Second Punic War. Uh, Ham uh, Hannibal himself had been on campaign since the age of nine, and uh, he had a huge amount of leadership experience and a very experienced army to lead. And he decided, right, I'm going to do this, and this time I'm not going to make the mistake of uh, trying to use sea power. It's going to be mainly a land invasion, and I'm going to go over the Alps, which he famously did with some elephants, which were almost irrelevant, but never mind, some elephants. And then he fought a battle against the Romans at the, at the, the river Ticinus, and he beat them. And then he fought uh, another battle at uh, the river Trebia, and he decisively beat them. And then the Romans started really taking him seriously, and they sent out another much bigger army, and he ambushed that at Lake Trasemone and annihilated it. And the Romans were, wow, really on the back foot, they were absolutely aghast. This, what? He beat three to, how? But we're Romans, we, we don't lose, what's going on? So, that's the background to the Battle of Cannae. Now, uh, winter has come, and uh, he has spent that at a town called Gerunium. And um, the, the, in the ancient world, not much fighting happened in winter normally. And the, uh, the, the Romans were, were licking their wounds from the campaigns of the, the year before and electing new consuls. Consuls uh, were generals, and they always had two of them uh, because they were constantly in fear of one person getting control of the army and then uh, taking over Rome and setting himself up as king or something. So two consuls made them feel much safer and they limited their power, uh, demanding, for instance, if, if they ever came uh, to, together in the same place, uh, they would have to um, share command between them. And uh, alternating days was one of the mechanisms that they came up with. But it wasn't the only one. Anyway, uh, how do we know all this? Well, we know this because various historians have told us. The two principal historians documenting the Second Punic War are Polybius and Livy. There are others, uh, Cornelius Nepos, Plutarch, Appian, and so forth, but they are in the main writing later and uh, not so relevantly to the Battle of Cannae. Now, Polybius was writing only 50 years after the events he was describing, and so he was able to talk to people who were alive and had been there. Uh, Livy, on the other hand, was writing more like two centuries later, and historians today generally think of him as less reliable, although he has given us a much more complete uh, history of the entire war. Uh, after Cannae, Polybius' uh, histories just exist in the form of fragments, whereas uh, Livy, we've got, um, got most of Livy's uh, accounts. So, but Livy tends to get a bit carried away, and he adds in all sorts of detail, and though they make good stories, we can't always rely on them. Uh, anyway, uh, so the uh, the consul from the previously 
previous year, Flaminius had been killed at the Battle of uh, Trasimene, and so he was replaced by a chap called Regulus. Um, and the consuls from the previous year, they then become proconsuls uh, who are still around uh, because the army still needs to be out there, needs to be commanded, uh, there's still a job to be done, but they become proconsuls when the new consuls are elected to replace them, and then they hand over uh, at, the, at a convenient time. So, uh, Civilius uh, was still alive from the previous year, and so he became a, a, a proconsul, and the new consuls were Lucius Aemilius Paulus, and uh, Gaius Terentius Varro. And from now on, I'm just going to call them Paulus and Varro. Uh, but b before I, I, I carry on, I will uh, make the point that if you read an account of Cannae and you say, Paulus, I can't find this guy Paulus anywhere. According to th this account, it was Aemilius who was in command of the Romans. Uh, this this uh, Lloyd chap on the Lini base channel has got it all wrong. Ah, no. Uh, he, he was uh, Lucius Aemilius Paulus, and I'm calling him by his last name, but uh, there doesn't need to be a very rigid convention here. Different historians pick one of the, the Romans' three names, and, and they tend to just use that all the time rather than using all three. So, uh, if you read some other account and it's Aemilius um, and not Paulus in command of the Romans, well, that's why, okay? Sorry for the confusion, but I hope that at least clears things up a bit. Uh, the Romans typically had three names, and one of them just gets picked seemingly at random by historians to be the, uh, the one when the full name isn't used. So, these two men were quite different from each other. Uh, Paulus was a patrician. He was of, a, of noble descent, and uh, he was he was one of the nobles, in with the nobles, respected by the nobles, and uh, they felt that, yeah, he's, he's our guy, whereas this Varro guy is it, it's the son of a, a lowly butcher. He's come up, uh, he's a man of the people, he's a demigod, he's a rabble-rouser. Uh, his supporters are, are described by Polybius as um, uh, noteworthy for their numbers rather than their dignity. I think you get the attitude. So uh, Varro was not one of us as far as the patricians were concerned, so it seems. Anyway, he'd come up uh, through the ranks and by getting the popular opinion behind him he'd been elected to high office and now this Varro guy was a, a consul and given command of an army. Now. This was a very special year. Normally, uh, a consular army would be perhaps two legions. It might have the same number of uh, allies, or two Roman legions, that is, and you would have the same number of uh, allies drawn from uh, the subjugated states around Rome. So they might be Etruscans or, or Samnites, people like that. Well, um, that would be a four legion army. Um, and that was normally considered adequate to, to, to see off any foe that Rome might face. But they're up against Hannibal, who seemed to just annihilate large armies sent against him. So they thought, right, OK, this may seem like a hammer to crack a nut, but let's just go for wild overkill. Let's just defeat this guy once and for all. Let's put an army in the field that is so staggeringly gargantuan that even if he does some clever ruse, he does these ambushes and things, even if he does some clever ruse, he still can't beat us because we will just overwhelming with, overwhelming with just sheer numbers. So they put into the... Uh, field 16 legions and the two consular armies would join together so this was 16 legions in one enormous great lump and these are not ordinary legions normally in the past a legion would be 4,000 infantry but they boosted that these were 5,000 infantry legions so they're extra strength as well normally you'd have maybe 200 cavalry but they made it 300 cavalry uh, and the allies were supposed to uh, supply three times as much cavalry as the Romans um, although it seems to me that they didn't. Um, Polybius says that it was the norm, but then doesn't go on to say, but they didn't actually supply it. But uh, when he describes the numbers of cavalry that the Romans had, he said they had 6,000 cavalry. Well, they would have had 9,600 cavalry if the Allies had put in three times as many. So it seems that the Allies put in maybe one and a half times as many as the Romans. Um, but even so, so you've got or, or than their usual amount. So uh, the Romans have not that many cavalry, but they've got an enormous great block of infantry. 16 legions. It's just, it's, it's staggering. So what were they going up against? Well, uh, Hannibal had maybe 40,000 infantry, uh, and um, but he had 10,000 cavalry. So if you go with the 9,600 figure for the Roman cavalry, then he had a slight advantage in cavalry, but most people, most historians agree that he had a significant advantage. So it looks like 10,000 Carthaginian cavalry against 6,000 Roman cavalry. Not staggeringly overwhelming, they don't have more than double the number, but 
a, a significant advantage to the Carthaginians in cavalry, but a significant disadvantage in infantry. So it could, they could have been outnumbered two to one if we go with Polybius's figures. Uh, but there are loads of problems with all the figures for, for troops for this battle and ancient battles in general. I'll get, I'll get on to that later. So uh, there was a third uh, Roman army, by the way, that was sent uh, as a diversion up to Gaul. And that was uh, quite significant because a lot of uh, Hannibal's army was made up of Gauls from what we call Cisalpine Gaul. You've got to remember that what we think of today is Italy. Um, the northern part of it was actually Celtic speaking. So they, they were Gauls and they were not part of the Roman sphere in this period. They hadn't, uh, they hadn't been conquered yet. And a lot of those Gauls were, had gone uh, down south with Hannibal and had been fighting very successfully uh, with him uh, against the Romans and getting revenge for slights against them in the past that the Romans had perpetrated. And uh, it seems being pretty enthusiastic warriors. So by sending a diversionary attack up north, perhaps they could persuade some of those Gauls to desert and go back to defend their homelands, but that didn't actually happen. Now, um, we have to think about the bias in the histories, because um, uh, Polybius, for instance, was a friend of uh, the grandson of Paulus. So, being a friend of the grandson of Paulus, he had a vested interest perhaps to make Paulus look, look good. And uh, how can you do that? Well, one thing you can do is you blame everything for the disaster on Varro. And uh, re reading his accounts, you do get the impression that he is a little bit biased and that uh, this, this Varro guy gets um, a somewhat unfair treatment. Meanwhile, Paulus is shown to be just ace. And uh, in Livy's account, uh, before Paulus leaves Rome, Fabius, who was the dictator in the previous year, who had a, uh, an idea that the best way to fight Hannibal isn't to take him on straight because he's just too good, his armies are too good and he's too good a leader. Instead, just shadow him and stop him uh, getting access to supplies and just wait for his army to just wither uh, and starve and for his various men to uh, desert, perhaps because they've, they've not been paid. And he goes further, he says that actually we later found out that he only had, uh, Hannibal only had 10 days of food left at Cannae, if only we just waited a bit. Um, and the Spaniards were, were seriously thinking of deserting um, and would have if only Cannae hadn't happened when it did. Duh, that Varro, if only he hadn't started uh, the, the battle when he did and had listened to Paulus, then everything would have been possibly all right. But instead we suffered, we the Romans suffered uh, the defeat of Cannae. Um, now, Fabius had a word, according to Livy, Fabius has a word, but who was, who was writing this all down? I mean, it's, it's all a little bit fishy. It's difficult to believe that there, you really can have a verbatim, uh, a recorded verbatim conversation written down two centuries after the fact between two private individuals uh, in, in ancient Rome. But anyway, Fabius uh, takes uh, Paulus aside and says, you know, you're actually up against two enemies here. You may think that your main enemy is Hannibal, uh, but uh, I know from experience, uh, that this Varro guy is perhaps more of an enemy to you and more therefore of an enemy to Rome than even Hannibal because he will disagree with you and he will be rash and foolish and he won't obey my advice but maybe you can take my advice and don't take Hannibal on straight. Um, instead, just as I say, shadow him, wait for his army to wither and die which is going to happen inevitably. Please believe me. Um, but uh, in Livy's account, uh, Paulus replies, well, uh, yeah, but People are going to criticise me if I do nothing. They're going to call me a coward if I just shadow him uh, all the time. And you know, I, I would rather face the dangers of battle uh, than the approbation of my of my comrades. So uh, perhaps he wasn't fully enthusiastic with Fabian strategy after all. But anyway, they they set out. Now the, um, there's a little um, there's a tale in Livy which gets a little bit uh, confusing because. He has a skirmish happen between uh, the Roman troops and Hannibal's troops, uh, and then following that he has this tale about two camps and the, tra the, the journey to Cannae, whereas in Polybius uh, they get all the way to, uh, to, to the Cannae area before the skirmish happens. Well, we don't know where this skirmish happens, but supposedly um, there was a skirmish which just happened against some of the Carthaginian troops, and it was going really well and they were inflicting significant casualties on the Carthaginians, uh, and Varro went, oh, this is going brilliantly, and he was encouraging the men, come on, yeah, yeah, follow it up, follow it up, keep them on the run, let's, let's make this, the, let's, let's get at them. Um, according to uh, Livy, Varro had earlier made some very arrogant speeches, uh, saying that he was just going to go out there and defeat this Hannibal guy. Well, of course, he probably felt safe to do so, because he'd been given an unprecedentedly immense army. But anyway, um, even so, it's a little bit arrogant, 
uh, and, and foolish of him to say, oh, it'll be easy, I'll get out there, and the job done, he was saying. Well, perhaps that's what he had in mind. Let's, let's press this all the way to the main army and let's carry the day. But Paulus was, oh, no, 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 stop, this might be a trap, trap. And he brought everything to a halt, and Varro was furious. And the, the men in the army were generally on Varro's side because he was a rabble rouser, a man of the people, and he was, he was good at, at getting them on his side like that and getting them angry publicly and, and riding the wave of their anger and directing this at poor Paulus, who had to try to counsel wisdom. So goes the account. Um, and uh, he got a vote uh, there and then, organised, Varro did, and the army was overwhelmingly behind him. Let's get after um, uh, Hannibal. And so they did. Um, did any of that happen? I think, given that Polybius also mentions a successful skirmish and, and a lot of the facts are the same, well, maybe it did happen, but it seems that Livy has moved these events earlier, which gives it a, a greater dramatic effect. And because it has a greater dramatic effect, that also makes it a little bit suspicious, don't you think? Anyway, he then tells an interesting tale of uh, a ruse that is repeated. Uh, Hannibal uh, comes out of his camp in which he leaves loads of treasure and his tents and fires burning so it looks occupied and then he goes behind a hill and waits in ambush hoping that the Romans will come along and go oh loads of treasure and uh, sack the camp and then he can ambush them but there are confusions here because he says in his account that he left the fires burning and the tents in so that the Romans would think that the camp was occupied but then he wanted them to say oh a load of unguarded treasure let's have it so does he want the Romans to think that the camp is occupied or unoccupied? Um, anyway, it seems that uh, one scout went in on his own, an officer, and had a look round and thought, this is fishy, you know? Some of these tent flaps are open and I can see into the tent and I can see treasure there. It's as though they want me to see it. And wait a minute, they've scattered silver in the lanes between the tent. This, what, this is fishy. I don't, I don't believe this. They wouldn't abandon the camp so utterly like this. Um, meanwhile, it seems that uh, uh, Paulus was watching the behaviour of some chickens and they were off their food, which is a bad omen, and so he was, he was counselling against the fight. And um, in Livy also, two slaves appear and say, oh, uh, yeah, Hannibal's just over that hill uh, waiting in ambush, so, uh, so uh, don't. Thing is, though, that if Hannibal was waiting in ambush for the Romans, well, then why didn't he spring the ambush? Um, so none of this story works quite right. So I, I think that something has been lost in the re retelling or else maybe it's a fabrication. But anyway, so the ambush doesn't happen and uh, Hannibal thinks, drat it, rumbled. Um, but then he repeats the ruse, but differently. This time it's just the same, uh, campfires burning in the, in, the, in the camp, tents, a uh, bit of treasure, probably not so much this time, um, making it look as though it's a ruse to make them all think that uh, he's trying to get away, but actually this time he was trying to get away. So this time the Romans uh, hesitated, went, oh, hang on, we think it's a trap, could be an ambush. Uh, but that time, no, he actually was marching away. and Presumably he could afford to uh, sacrifice a load of tents. Incidentally, in Livy's description of the Carthaginian camp, it comes across just like a Roman camp. Um, but then Livy was writing 200 years later, and possibly that was a failure of imagination on his part. Though I know of no reason why the Carthaginian camps should have been very different from uh, Roman ones. Uh, anyway, so uh, he uses the ruse twice, but to a different purpose. The second time he uses it in order to steal a march and get away. Um, and the, the Romans then delay uh, in, in following after him. Uh, but even then, there's, um, there's a contradiction here, because Livy says that the, the, the Roman uh, people roused up by Varro again, uh, the Roman soldiers, uh, they, they say, no, 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 we want action. We should get after him and loot the camp. Well, which? If you want to just charge after him, then you're going to do that. Or if you're going to stop and loot the camp, you're going to do that. But uh, again, because he's try it seems that uh, Livy's trying to have it both ways, I don't entirely buy the story. But anyway... Uh, so he uses this ruse twice to opposite effects, and he gets away. And he goes to a place called Cannae. Now, Cannae was a fortified town, and it had a large grain reserve there. Hannibal had a supply problem. He didn't own any of the farms. He was having to forage for food, uh, and uh, uh, that's pretty tricky when you've got a very large army to feed. And he was very low on supplies. Don't forget he had a lot of um, horses as well, which require an awful lot of fodder. Um, you've got to you know, have ground for them to, to graze in. And you can't carry huge amounts of fodder everywhere you go for the horses. So it is a, was a constant logistical problem for him. So he went to Cannae because 
the Senate had ordered all the farmers in the air, in, in, in Ro under the Roman controlled lands to s harvest their, their, their uh, grain as early as possible and store it in fortified places, Cannae being one of them. But uh, Cannae was uh, not uh, well fortified in this period, it had been uh, badly, its fortifications had been badly damaged and Hannibal was able to take it and that alarmed the Romans. Uh oh! Because it commanded a very fertile plain in the southeast of Italy um, and uh, they thought, right, if we go there with an army, we're going to be drawn into a fight because it's a big plain, he'll see us, we'll see him, he'll know that we've seen him, and uh, this, 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 this place can I, commands this fertile valley, and if he gets access to all the food there, oh no, this is not good, this is not good. We, okay, so the Romans then went on, on pursuit of him uh, to Cannae. Uh, Paulus constantly uh, wanting, we are told, to just shatter him and, and make sure that he didn't uh, um, get all the foraging done that he wanted, constantly harassing his foragers, making it and, and whittling away, attacking small parties of, fa of foragers, whittling away at his army by small increments, but uh, Varro just wanted to get in there. Now, they went for alternating command, uh, so Polybius and Livy tell us. So one day the army would be commanded in its entirety by Paulus and the next by Varro. And this definitely was one way that they shared command. Although it's not the only way. Just the previous year uh, Fabius and uh, Minucius had decided to have half the army each under constant command. So it wasn't the only way they could have shared command. But this is, we are told, uh, what happened. So um, you had the days when the rash guy was in command, so maybe Hannibal could get him to attack, and the, guy, and the days when the more cautious guy was in command and Hannibal would have a more difficult time. Um, uh, on one day uh, Hannibal told his men to just prepare, get ready, because we're going to be fighting the next day. Uh, that was a Varro day, although we're also told that um, Hannibal knew exactly who was in command and knew exactly what was going on through some network of spies. It, this is never explained, but somehow he just knew exactly who was in command and what their personalities were like and, and you know, all those useful details. Um, the next day, on a palace day, he arrayed his army. Come on then, let's have a fight, said Hannibal. Uh, but Paulus was having none of it. Um, and towards the end of the day, Hannibal got, oh, he's not going to fight. Okay, he took uh, his troops back into camp, but dispatched his Numidians. Now, his Numidians were North African light cavalrymen. He had loads of these, and they were really good, really effective troops. But these were light cavalrymen. They were armed with uh, a smallish shield, javelins. They would have had some other armament, a, a club, a dagger or whatever, but their main weapon was javelins. And so they were, they were skirmishing. They weren't getting in there and punch and slug it out type cavalry. They were ride around, keep moving, confuse the enemy, keep coming at him from different uh, angles and harassing him, chucking javelins at him and just generally being annoying sort of cavalry. And he sent them out to attack the watering parties. Now the Romans had camped with two thirds of their troops on one side of the river uh, Orphidus and uh, one third on the other side, on this flat, agriculturally rich plain, and according to uh, Livy, dusty plain as well, but uh, Polybius never mentions the dust. And uh, he was able with his uh, Numidians to disrupt the, uh, the men who had been sent down to the river to get water for all the tens of thousands of men in the camp. So you imagine they'd need quite a bit of water, so if you could stop them getting access to the water that would be uh, an, quite an inconvenience for them. Uh, and this was quite successful, and it it, um, it it put the Romans, it annoyed the Romans to an extraordinary degree. Not only were they a bit thirsty, but there was this continuing suspense. They knew that an enormous battle against this deadly foe was coming really soon, near certainly on this plain, one of these days. And being in suspense uh, is extremely stressful. And in, in all sorts of wars, uh, soldiers report this, that they, they end up thinking, let's have the fight. They would rather have the fight just to end this horrendous suspense. And this is uh, reported by uh, Polybius. So the next day, it was a Varro command and Varro went, right, we're doing this. And he led his men out. He uh, put them all on one side of the river. Uh, now in this video, I'm not gonna get bogged down with where exactly, the exact geography of the, um, of the camps and, and the river and, and the battle itself, because I could spend an entire video on it and I'd end up having to conclude, but we don't really know. So what would be the point of all that? Um, but anyway, we can't be entirely sure which side of the river uh, the battle happened on and which way people were facing and which way was right and left, but never mind. Uh, the, the broad story of, the, of the, uh, the battle is clear enough, so it doesn't really matter. There was a, a river which, uh, there's still a river there today, but the river there today has migrated quite a bit. So if you go to the, the site of Cannae today, 
um, do bear in mind that the river that you see was nowhere near where uh, it was back in the days uh, of this, the battle in 216 BC. So and we can't be completely sure where it was, we just know it's moved a fair bit, migrated across the plain. So anyway, they got all on one side of the, uh, the river and uh, he brought out his, the, the entire army and arrayed it. He had the, the Roman citizen cavalry uh, on the right and he had them quite close to the river, anchoring one, flight, uh, one flank, and then arrayed in one enormous block with all his infantry, according to Polybius, 80,000, although, as you'll see, that figure doesn't quite add up. Maybe it was 70,000, but it was an awful lot, anyway. Um, and uh, he, al he also adds the detail that they are arrayed uh, with a narrower front and, and greater depth than usual. And on the other side were the Allied cavalry. Now, he makes it quite clear that Paulus was with the cavalry on the right, the Roman citizen cavalry, who were next to the Roman uh, citizen troops, and that uh, Varro was on the left with the Allied cavalry uh, near the Allied uh, infantry. Which is a little bit odd, because the position of honour um, when you were commanding an army normally was on the right. That, so that would suggest that Paulus was actually in command on that day, and not Varro. Um, he also tells us that uh, the proconsuls, uh, Regulus and um, Civilius were commanding the troops in the centre, so they had four commanders. Um, there's a little bit of discrepancy here, because uh, according to Livy, um, uh, another guy called Attilius uh, was considered too old and infirm for uh, the, the battle and was sent home. Uh, and, and first I thought, oh, who is this guy? He's a completely different guy. No. Uh, his name was uh, Regulus Marcus uh, Attilius. So some historians abbreviate that to Regulus, and some have gone with uh, Attilius, and I dare say someone somewhere has gone with Marcus. So it's actually the same guy. It's the same problem I was talking about earlier. So there are either two, one or two proconsuls in the middle. So they've got either three or four main commanders. So um, why? And how come Paulus is on the right? Well, what I'm about to say is pure conjecture for me. I haven't got it out of any book. This is just the way I see it. The Romans had a massive problem of command and control. They had zero experience of, of handling an army this big. Now, what was the frontage of the Roman army? We don't know, but we can conjecture. Now, the, I did in one book see a conjecture that the, the army was five miles across. I don't think that's true. I think the, the, the widest reasonably credible frontage I've, I've seen quoted in the book is three miles, uh, but even that I think is on the high side. But let's say, let's say, let's say it was 2,000 yards, which is not very different from two kilometres, if you want to be metric about it. Um, that's a long way. If a guy is two kilometres away on a flat-ish plain with a little bit of roll to it, uh, and don't forget, this is this is not just flat battlefield. There's no such thing as a battlefield. This was agricultural land, so there'd have been hedges and barns and fences and sheep and uh, olive groves and vines and, and you know, some quite tall crops. It would be very difficult to see anyone uh, two kilometres away. But you could blow a trumpet in a battle. When once the battle, he's not going to hear you. He's two thousand yards away. He's not. You could wave a banner. Nah, he's not going to see it. You're going to have to send a runner. Well, that's going to take ages because he's 2,000 yards away and there's a battle on and loads of terrain to negotiate. So there is a huge command and control problem that the Romans have. And I think that uh, the explanation isn't that, oh, it was this guy rather than that guy, or they, they, they've lied and that they've swapped them around. I think they were all in command because they probably had a meeting and decided very quickly, none of us has any experience uh, of commanding this number of troops, even if... Um, uh, one of the proconsuls, for instance, is in command of just half the infantry. That's still an army twice the size of any army he would ever have had experience of commanding before. So all of these guys are really up against it for the sheer scale of the operation they have to mount. So um, troops want to be within uh, bugle distance and, and, and order receiving distance of a commander. Someone's meant to be in control of them. Um, and if a commander is so far away, they have they feel no connection with him, they won't, won't feel in command, and might just stand around doing nothing, which is what uh, troops tend to default to if they are not actually uh, given very definite orders. So I think the Romans had a huge and unprecedented command and control problem, and their solution was to have a number of commanders 
and a really simple battle plan and formation. Let's just put all our troops in one block, maybe making it narrower so that the distances for command and control uh, aren't so great, so that bugles will carry uh, to the ears of a greater number of men. And uh, yeah, we'll solve our problem that way. And since we overwhelm this guy, even if he's got some guys over there in ambush or something, if we just hit the center of his army with everything we've got, it's just a massive hammer, it will just smash him by sheer force of numbers. How can he, but we, we outnumber him two to one. And, and you know, how can, he, how can we possibly lose here? So let's just say that our battle plan is advance and engage the enemy and leave it at that. One of the things that makes me like this idea is that if Hannibal's plan that uh, was enacted, which then defeated the Romans, really was his, his one plan right from the start, and that he had predicted exactly what the Romans were going to do, that they were going to fall into his trap in this very particular way, then the problems that he might have perceived that his enemy had might have made him more confident in his predictions. So he might have said to himself, or to his commanders uh, around the table in, in, the, in the command tent meeting the night before, it's actually to our advantage that they've got so many troops because they won't be able to control that number of troops. What I think they'll do is just stick them all in one huge lump and just tell them all to go forwards and attack because I think that's what they will conclude is the wisest thing to do because if they try anything complicated, it could go horribly, horribly wrong. So they'll just keep it simple, in which case, they may fall into my trap. Now, Hannibal uh, had, up till now, always had lots of ruses in his battles, and they'd all involved hidden troops and an ambush at some point. Um, so I think that the Romans, uh, um, going forwards, would be super wary of an ambush. They'd be looking around all the time for where, where is he hidden the ambush? Where are the troops going to come at us from? Um, and one thing you will do, of course, is look at the front of the, the army arrayed in front of you and, and, and see what he's got there. And is, is that all his troops? And if Hannibal arrayed in the way that a lot of historians believe, then a lot of his best troops, his, his, uh, his Africans, uh, his, his Libyans and Carthaginian troops, the very experienced spearmen, uh, they would not have been, many of them, visible on the front line. So, they, so that immediately would put, perhaps put into the heads of the Romans, they must be hiding, hiding uh, behind a, a, a little rise in the ground somewhere. They're, they're, they're all lying on the ground behind that hedge or, or something. Um, that would be preying on their minds constantly. And the more the Romans are looking there and there and there for a trap, the less likely they are to realise that the entire Carthaginian army that they're looking at is the trap. So uh, Hannibal... Uh, in response to, the, to, to Varro's leading out his forces, uh, which, by the way, was, uh, would have had the, the Willites, the light troops, out in front. And so far as I can tell, the Romans would have had a significant numerical advantage in, in Willites, the light troops, light skirmishing troops. Um, Hannibal only had about 8,000, whereas a quarter of the Roman army, according to Polybius, was, uh, was light troops. Anyway, um, Hannibal and all the sources are clear that he crossed the river, but that's not worry ourselves about in which direction he was going. He crossed the river in order to fight this battle and he sent his lights out in front uh, and then according to Livy he followed with the rest of his army but according to Polybius he then sent across his pikes. Now there's a problem there. Did he really have pikemen? Is this just a problem of translation? Um, but it, it does say in the sources, pikemen. Um, now, it occurs to me it's just a possibility. You might send guys armed with pikes across a river just to, to hold off any sudden enemy attack whilst you're getting other rest of your, the rest of your army across. And then those men, having done that job, might then just put down the pikes and take up some other weapon and become spearmen, perhaps, for the rest of the battle. That's possible, but yeah, a little bit unlikely. It's certainly conjectural. Um, we are told over and over again that so much Roman kit had been looted in the previous battles that his um, heavy infantry, that is to say the Carthaginian heavy infantry, were now from a distance near indistinguishable from Romans. So that would certainly mean that they would have the, the Roman shield, the scutum, as well as a lot of Roman armour and helmets. Um, and if you've got a scutum in one hand, you can't really use a pike in the other hand. A pike is a, definitely a two-handed weapon. So. Most modern historians are of the opinion that, in fact, he wasn't using pikes at this battle um, and that uh, he had spearmen instead. 
Uh, there is also a literary reference to uh, the fact that these spears were apparently a little bit shorter than the spears of the triarii that the Romans were using, so in that case they were using spears, and definitely not pikes, which would have been longer. Okay, so, a bit of an aside there, but uh, I think probably spears, probably not pikes, but it does say pikes. So, Hannibal gets across the river and then arrays his troops. He also has cavalry on the flanks, this is completely normal in an ancient battle. Um, opposite the allied cavalry he has his Numidians, uh, that I've described before, and opposite the Roman cavalry, close to the river, uh, where there's not so much room to fight, he has his Spanish and Celtic cavalry. In, uh, in a little way in from the sides of them, he has his Africans, his, his veterans, perhaps his best uh, troops, certainly his best foot troops. Um, what formation were they in? Um, we'll come on to that later. And then between those he has the Spanish and the Gauls. Now, um, uh, Livy just says the Spanish and the Gauls, and what a lot of people will do when reconstructing the ancient battle is they'll just assume, well, all the Spanish together, boom, one great big block, because that's quite normal, and then all the Gauls together. But Polybius uses the word alternating. He says this quite clearly. So what does that mean? Does it mean some Spanish, all of the Gauls, some other Spanish, so that, the, that there's a sort of symmetrical arrangement? Or does it mean Spanish Gauls, Spanish Gauls, Spanish Gauls, Spanish Gauls, Spanish Gauls, alternating by small units all the way across the line? Um, judging by what happened after that, and what I think is probably more sensible, I think it's the latter. I think it's lots of little ones, but we don't know. And there's no point in my uh, trying to you know, convince you with any sort of authoritative yes or no, because we just don't know. But anyway, alternating Spanish and Gauls uh, in the line. Now, uh, there is this famous bulge where the, the, the Spanish and, and Gaul supposedly uh, formed a, 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 a con, what's that, convex uh, crescent facing the Romans. Um, now, it is described, how did it happen? Um, it, 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 it's referred to, was it deliberate by Hannibal? Did he want that formation? Did some of the Gauls in the middle just say, come on, come on, let's, let's get them, why are we starting this battle then, and go, and go forwards? Uh, was it accidental? Don't forget, when um, the, the battle lines are this long, you might think you're in a straight line, but you're not. So uh, you can see, well, I, I'm here, well, yeah, it's a pretty straight line to there, and I can't really see any further than that, so we're fine. But the guy who's at the, the, the extreme of uh, your, your site, might be looking to the right, thinking, well, they're behind me to the right, but whoa, hang on, they're, they're behind me. I'm, I'm at the front here. How did this happen? That's a straight line. All those guys can see straight. No, guys, we're, we're too, well, I'm too far. We need to pull back. It could have, it could have been accidental. Anyway, uh, very soon in this tale, the battle is about to start, but in order to um, you know, raise suspense levels that are still within legal limits as set down by the U YouTube statute of, of, of uh, narrative practice, um, uh, I'm going to go to my sponsor. Now, uh, this has been sponsored uh, very generously by The Great Courses Plus. Now, just in case you don't know what The Great Courses Plus is, uh, it's an enormous website which has loads and loads of lectures, uh, over 11,000 of them now, and constantly being added to every week by a huge staff. Uh, a while ago I was in the Washington area and I visited the offices and I, I found that the, in order to do the graphics and the effects and you know all, all, all the stuff you've got to do to make one of these videos, they had, had 80, 80, 80 people working on it, which uh, certainly uh, makes me, I'm just a little one-man band, feel rather insignificant. But anyway, so they have uh, tremendous resources to put into these uh, th these videos, they have proper studios and all the rest of it, um, and they bring in professors from very prestigious universities, uh, particularly the, the Ivy League universities of, uh, of East and USA, but not exclusively. Um, and uh, one of the uh, lecture courses uh, that I, I noticed there was uh, The Rise of Rome, uh, which is a series of 24 half-hour lectures. half hour is quite manageable, isn't it? Um, it's probably going to be shorter than this is going to turn out to be. Um, and it, it's not just battles and generals and so forth, it's also the rise of Rome as looked from uh, its constitution, the society, the, the, what held the society together, religion and economics and so forth. Why was Rome so successful across the board, not just militarily? Um, and number nine is all about the Second Punic War, which makes it absolutely pertinent to what I'm talking to uh, about today. And it's taught by a guy who's got swagger, who's got an impressive vocabulary of one-handed uh, gestures, and uh, my word, that guy's got shoulders. Um, now, if you go to www.thegreatcoursesplus.com, 
dot com stroke Lindy Beige, or you could just click the, the link in the description, which is much easier, uh, then you could take advantage of a free trial. So why not do that? It's completely free. Um, if you like it, you can then choose to subscribe and there's no limit to the number of, of lectures you watch. So you could just spend your whole time binge watching if you want and get through uh, loads and loads of lectures in, in one month. Uh, so there's no limit and no exams at the end of it, which yeah, is personally just wonderful because don't we all hate exams? I, I certainly did. I'm so glad I don't have to do another exam. Exam. Although actually sometimes when I'm making these videos I feel this is a bit like an exam because of course I have to do quite a bit of swatting before I do one of these all-in-one take spiels to camera so it's a bit like swatting for an exam. Oh I've just ruined it for myself now. Huh. Anyway maybe I shouldn't have said that. So the Great Courses Plus um, and uh, yes uh, I'm, yeah I think I've said I think that's it. Um, so uh, the Great Courses Plus address and here it is on the screen again and click on the link and free trial Lectures, knowledge, marvellous. It's not all a history either. It's, it, it's how to do stuff like cooking and photography and chess. Uh, and there's um, all sorts of stuff on science and, oh, you'll love it. Art, the lot. Anyway, so back to the Battle of Cannae. Now, the battle opens with a cavalry engagement on the Roman right. This is close to the river and both Polybius and Livy remark that this is a very unusual cavalry engagement. Um, uh, they, there just isn't room for them to wheel about and have, have little passing attacks and then and to attack and retreat and attack and retreat. They are actually forced to just go straight at each other and just slug it out. According to Polybius, uh, the Romans largely dismounted to fight, uh, but according to Livy, he doesn't mention dismounting at all. In fact, he describes quite graphically men being dragged out of their saddles. So they've gone, they've gone close enough and have come to a halt, which is something that cavalrymen never want to do. If you can, if you can fight never coming to a halt uh, and you're a cavalryman, that's good. As soon as you come to a halt, you are so vulnerable. Horses are so vulnerable. It's very easy for someone to stab your horse and then you're a bit stuffed, aren't you, if you're a cavalryman? You're then, well, a pedestrian. Um, so men are brutally fighting each other at very close quarters. Um, the Carthaginians had uh, better cavalry and more cavalry and seemingly more vicious cavalry. And though uh, both authors say that the Romans fought hard and gallantly and all the rest of it, they lost. Um, and it could be that rather than losing a small number and then the rest of them routing away, which is what normally happens, it could be that so many of them were killed that actually they were no longer a viable unit on the field, uh, which is very significant for what happened next. Now, whilst that was going on, the infantry were advancing on each other. The, at first, you've got the lights, uh, which would attack each other. And one thing I want to make clear about light infantry is that one of their... Um, principal functions is to screen the main army. So if uh, you are setting up in a very particular way and you don't want the enemy to see how you're deploying your troops, you can send out loads of lights and they can skirmish like crazy in front of your army and the enemy won't be able to see through that mass of moving men, all those shields, all those javelins and all the rest of it, um, and the backs of their own lights trying to deal with them. So uh, it could be that uh, one of the reasons that uh, Hannibal threw out a screen of skirmishers was to hide what he was up to behind that screen. We don't know that. It's not in any of the sources, but it's possible. Anyway, uh, the light, uh, the engagement of the lights, it seems, was fairly neutral. Neither side got any particular advantage, and after a while they withdrew through the lines of the advancing heavy infantry, which then clashed. And of course, the first to clash were the Spaniards and Gauls who were right at the front of that bulge in the line, be it a deliberate or accidental one. Um, so the Romans hit that and um, though of course uh, the, uh, the, the, the fierce Gauls with their long uh, slashing swords and the experienced Spaniards with their um, Hispaniensis sword, it very, it's, it's, a, it's a, the ancestor of the Gladius, it's a shorter, pointy, more of a stabby sort of sword, uh, but they had very similar shields, both the Gauls and the, and the Spaniards. Um, uh, they fought very gallantly at first, but then the Romans, by sheer weight of numbers coming at them, started to push them back. Now, here I have a little bit of trouble reading the sources because it seems that um, the, the, the language they use suggests that the, the, Ro the, uh, the Gauls and Spaniards were turning tail, which suggests you actually you know, turn your back on the enemy, and running, running for their lives, says Polybius at one point, suggesting that they're actually sprinting away from the Romans, who are then physically chasing them, um, triumphantly surging forward, says Polybius at one point. Uh, but then 
um, the language gets very confused. They came to, uh, Livy at one point says, they, they, until they came to the position of the, uh, the Carthaginian uh, auxiliaries, uh, African auxiliaries. So who were they then? Are they the, the, the African heavy infantry either side? Well, they would normally be called auxiliaries. Do they mean the, the, the light troops that had, had gone back through? Had they gone penetrated the line? The word penetrated is used a few times, but you could penetrate a formation, as in go all the way through the troops and past them, or you could, you could penetrate the position that a, a formation was holding, and, and that is a form of penetration as well. It, it's, all a, it's all a bit vague and frustrating. What exactly happened when... The, the, the Gauls and Spaniards fell back, but they did fall back, and the bulge became concave. So the, the, uh, at one point, uh, no, at a few points, Livy uses a word which is often translated as wedge, which suggests that, which suggests a very sort of uh, an offensive formation designed to smash through the opposition. But anyway, crescent uh, is, is the way that it's normally uh, understood. So this uh, bulge became concave, and it became a, a sack into which the Romans moved. Now, what Roman, what formation were the Romans in? Were they were they in their checkerboard formation, with gaps in between each of the either sentries or maniples, depending on uh, which version of the checkerboarding they used? If they had gaps like that, then as they surged forward victoriously against the enemy, there was a natural gap to move into, and so that it was possible for the Romans to be closing up into those gaps as they went forward. Or but maybe they were absolutely without gaps. Maybe there was a con a continuous line of Romans, um, but even then, uh, if you if you are in a, a line against the, the the front of a bulge, uh, it will be a temptation for that line to close in against that bulge, and then when the bulge turns into a concave shape, and you 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 then find yourself just bunching up into that concave shape. So either way, the Romans will end up more bunched up, and Hannibal and Mago, who were commanding the centre. Uh, oh, here's another um, discrepancy. According to uh, Livy Mahabal, uh, who was the, com uh, the second in command at uh, Lake Trasemini, was uh, commanding the Numidians. Uh, but according to Polybius, it was a chap called Hanno. Uh, anyway, Hasdrubal was with the, uh, the Spaniards and the, and the, um, uh, the Celts uh, on the other side. Sorry, I should have said that earlier. Anyway, um, Hannibal and his brother Mago were commanding the troops in the middle, suggesting to me that that's where they felt they were the most needed. So this was the, if there was if this was all a deliberate plan, uh, that was where they were going to be most needed. They had to make sure that that sack didn't burst. It certainly didn't burst prematurely. If uh, it did get penetrated, he had all his lights to 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 flood the gap and and, and seal it up. Um, Balearic slingers. It was it was a multinational uh, army. The, uh, the the Carthaginian army. He had mercenaries from all around the Mediterranean. Uh, anyway, the sack held long enough for the Africans on the side to seal the trap and the doom of all the Romans who had run into that sack. Now, how did they do this? It could be uh, that there was a, a bulge like that, and then on the end of the line, two uh, units of spearmen arranged in the usual way. So when the bulge went became concave, those units then just moved like this, wheeling, as we would call it, wheeling, and according to, to Livy, even sealing the trap, even joining up into a, a, a ring around the Romans. Uh, wheeling, though, is a little bit difficult. I consulted um, uh, my lecturer, John Lazenby, who's a, a noted author of Battles of the Ancient World, and uh, he said that the literal meaning of Polybius uh, is that each man turned on the spot as an individual. So one way of reconstructing the battle is that actually the Africans were formed up in columns either side of the, the bulge, and when the Romans dived into the sack, those columns either advanced, and then every man turned on the spot so that they could then just go slam that way, or uh, the, the sack uh, gave ground, exposing these two columns of troops, which then were able to just do that. Either way, the Romans were caught in the trap. Uh, the men could, could fight, uh, kill a few. Every time the, uh, any of the Romans died, they would have to close up ranks, and they, they found that they were just closing up ranks inwardly always. There was no space to expand, and after a while they were so pressed together that they couldn't fight properly, and it was just butchery, it was just slaughter. The men um, stood almost no chance. Once they were sealed in like that, uh, the, the veteran Africans 
uh, the Libyans and Carthaginian spearmen just mowed them down. Now, um, I haven't mentioned what was happening with the Numidians on the other side of the battle, on the, on the Roman left. Well, um, according to Livy, um, the opening on, on that side was the load of Numidians uh, pretending to desert to the Roman side and then treacherously um, uh, producing hidden swords that they'd somehow hidden under their tunics and no one had noticed this because um, they, they dumped, ostentatiously, they dumped their uh, uh, javelins and shields down and the Romans then led them to the back and said, said stay there. Uh, but then when, once the, uh, the Romans were distracted by other uh, events in the battle, they then treacherously ran forward and started hamstringing men. And uh, yeah, it's not impossible. It does strike me as very uh, unlikely though. Uh, Appian, in his uh, history, which is written later again, uh, has the same story, only it's not Numidians doing it, it's, um, it's the Celtiberians, uh, the Celtiberian light troops. Um, so that makes it, I think, even less likely. But anyway, maybe that happened. More likely is what Polybius describes, it's just that the, the Numidians just whirled round and round and round, they outnumbered the Allied cavalry in front of them, and they were very good horsemen, and they just kept those guys busy not inflicting many casualties, but not taking many either. They never got to grips with the enemy. They were just, as I say, making these passing, harassing attacks with, with javelins. And so they were whirling round and round and round, just keeping that Roman cavalry or allied Roman cavalry busy so that it couldn't interfere with the, the main battle. Then Hasdrubal, who had won his victory on the other flank, rode up uh, with his guys, which is of course possible because maybe they weren't needed to pursue fleeing uh, Roman cavalry because they'd killed so many, there was no viable unit on that side that they had to deal with. So he was free to ride across the battle and join in with the Numidians against the, um, the, the, the Latin allied cavalry on the Roman side and his arrival just made the Latin cavalry, okay that's it, we're off. And they fled. And then Hasdrubal, according to Polybius, made the very good decision which is that he would not pursue with his troops and he gave the uh, Numidians that, trip, that uh, task. Numidians, you pursue the uh, fleeing uh, Latin allied cavalry and just keep them busy and that frees us to come round and then charge into the, the, the rear uh, of, the, uh, of the Roman infantry, which he did apparently many, many times from all sorts of distant, different angles, constantly uh, sapping the morale and boot of the Romans and boosting the morale of the Africans who were doing so much butchery. Um, of course, if you remember, uh, according to Livy, the, the Africans had actually sealed the bag, uh, but most people think that uh, they wouldn't have sealed the bag completely. There would have been a gap uh, for uh, the uh, Spanish and Celtic cavalry under Hasdrubal to do their work. Anyway, so they hacked and hacked and hacked, and casualties. Now then, um, according to Polybius, 70,000 Romans were killed. Um, uh, Livy is, is um, not quite so extreme, he says 45,000, uh, other estimates 65,000, there are loads of figures, but it's a vast number, Which, whichever account you go with, it's a staggeringly vast number. Uh, I'm actually a little suspicious of uh, Polybius's numbers. Polybius is normally considered to be more um, reliable, he was writing uh, much closer to the events, but he says, for instance, that there were 80,000 Romans in the main block of infantry. But then later he says that 10,000 who were in the camps, who were put there to defend the camps, uh, then got captured. So were they in addition to the 80,000? Because if there were 16 legions in the field of 5,000 strong, that's 80,000. So was, were, were there in fact 70,000 plus 10,000 in the camps? Or did two other legions that we weren't told about uh, turn up? Were there in fact 18 Roman legions? And you, different accounts, if, if you've read several accounts of this, some of them will say 18 legions, some of them will say 16. I think I've seen 14. There are various estimates, but 16 legions, I think we're fairly solidly um, be sure of. So maybe there were only actually 70,000 uh, in the main block, but does that mean that every single one of them was killed? That seems so unlikely. I mean, men after a while, they just surrender. If you're, if you're one of a tiny number left and you just can't survive, just drop your weapon and put your hands up and, and, and hope that they're taking captives. And it seems that the Carthaginians were taking captives. They, they negotiated terms with the men who were surrounded in the camps and um, Hannibal agreed uh, to ransom them even. Uh, in fact, later he let all the allied ones just go for free. Uh, but he said, it was, uh, I'll ransom you. It's uh, 300 uh, denarii for a, a Roman soldier and it's uh, 200 for an allied and uh, 100 for a slave. Um, uh, later in another meeting, he upped the price for, for cavalry, but never mind. Um, so it seems that the Carthaginians were taking prisoners. Um, now then, 
Um, whew, I, <laughs> I've got a lot to cover in this, in this and I'm uh, having to just pause a second uh, whilst I reconstruct my thoughts. So, um, I didn't talk about uh, the, what the Gauls looked like. Um, the Gauls, according to Polybius, were naked, uh, which some people consider as quite a, a romantic image of the, of the Celtic fighter. I think it's a little bit unlikely. I mean, it's so impractical. You just graze your knee if you just stumbled a bit. I know. And a draw cut. Well, if it will, will, you can you can save yourself from a draw cut uh, with just a you know a woolen tunic or, or and with something underneath it. You don't need anything very spectacular. You don't need a huge amount of armor. But a draw cut on skin will just slice, and you'll lose so much blood. So why why fight naked? Some people say, oh, it was a religious thing. They 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 had maybe woed on them, and they'd done some prayers, and they believed that they were their nakedness made them somehow invulnerable. Really, I, I suppose it's possible, but it does strike me a little bit unlikely. But Livy he said that they were naked from the waist up, which is a way. Uh, you'll often see uh, um, uh, Celtic uh, warriors portrayed today. They've got a pair of trousers on because they're barbarians, um, but they're naked from the waist up. And of course, always spectacularly muscular because, well, that's artists for you. Um, and they were using they were using cut, cutting swords. The uh, meanwhile, the uh, the Africans were supposedly in clean white linen tunics, quite short, trimmed with what is usually referred to as purple. But this wouldn't be imperial purple. This would be more like what we today call perhaps indigo. Um, and um, the was it luck? Was it the, how much did Hannibal really know about what the Romans did? Because it suggests that Hannibal had no plan B, and I would have thought he would need a plan B because this this is not a completely foolproof plan, is it? He would have to know that the Romans are going to form up in just that way and behave in just the way he expected, not only at the command level but the troops. Uh, you're closing up as they went forward. It, it all had to just click into place and all his men would have to do their duty um, just at the right time. Now, tantalizingly, Polybius at one point, when he's describing the, the Africans, uh, if you like, sealing the trap, he, he says in one sentence that they were responding to the circumstances of the moment. And then in the very next sentence, he says, and it went exactly as Hannibal had planned. Well, which? Is it that they're, they're thinking, oh, uh, hey, this is going a bit weirdly, but maybe we have an opportunity there. If we do X, Y, and Z, we can perhaps uh, seal a trap and, and then win the battle. Or is it that they're waiting for the trigger when the uh, Romans come past you on your side here, pushing the Spaniards and Celts back. When they get to a certain point, then I want you to turn left and then uh, uh, or, or wheel left and, and seal the trap. Maybe there was just a trigger point that they were waiting for. But from that sentence, that combination of two sentences, we don't get it. Uh, so was was Hannibal just lucky? Was it that, that, that uh, the bulge uh, happened accidentally and just happened to make his uh, his plan work so much better? Um, how come the, the, the Gauls and Spaniards pressed so hard, didn't just give way? It was a very thin line, much thinner, for two reasons. One, there are half as many men in it, and, and two, it, it curves are longer lines than straight lines, so you stretch yourself thinner by putting yourself into a curve. Um, so how did they manage to hold off for so long? Um, well, anyway, it, it seems they did. They, there was Hannibal there to say, steady lads, steady lads, and perhaps that's what uh, turned the tide. Uh, anyway, um, uh, Livy tells an interesting story about what happened to a load of the, uh, the uh, Romans who had fled to the two camps. Actually, he says that uh, Paulus had put in a load of men uh, in, in one of the camps in order to attack Hannibal's camp during the battle. And he even says that this happened, uh, but uh, Hannibal had stationed perhaps 8,000 Gauls, in some versions of the story, uh, to defend the camp. So uh, he, he, he was able to repulse that attack, actually going there in person, because things were going so well with the general battle that uh, he just left that and, and directed the... Uh, defence of his camp, and then managed somehow to kill 2,000 Romans, which seems a suspiciously large number of them, uh, and, and chase them all the way back to their camp and surround them again. Um, night fell, and uh, there were 7,000 in one camp and 10,000 Romans in the other, and the 10,000 sent a message uh, to the, the, the smaller camp saying, come over to us, uh, and then we'll all escape together under cover of darkness. The, the enemy, they're all um, celebrating and looting and exhausted from all the fighting and so forth. You can do it. And then the, the guys in the smaller camp go, oh yeah, brilliant, you want us to come to you. There are more of you, so it's easier for you in, en masse to come to us. Why don't you just do that instead of sending us a message? Oh no, you want us to do the more dangerous thing, don't you? And then of course a hero steps forward and said, come on lads, we've got to do this. And about 600 of them 
about 600 of them did go across and a load of them escaped. And they went to a town called Canusium. Um, Varro, uh, he um, disgracefully, according to Polybius, uh, fled the field and he went to Venusium with just 70 cavalry. He was able to scrape together just 70 cavalry and about 300 others. And it's, it's, um, it's pitiful how few uh, Romans, in all the accounts, it seems, got away, and so many of them were then rounded up later by uh, marauding Numidians and the like. Um, and, um, and on the way back, uh, there was a lady, that, one of those little um, uh, stories that Livy throws in, called Busa, who, uh, out of her own pocket, put money for the road, uh, to, uh, into the pockets of, uh, not the had pockets, into the hands of uh, the, these, these uh, fugitive Romans and gave them food and clothes and for that she was honoured after the war. Oh. Anyway, um, so Varro had made his escape. Um, meanwhile Paulus uh, was dead, as were Servilius and if he was there, Regulus. Um, and Man Minucius as well, the master of horse uh, under, under Fabius uh, from the year before. Now how did that happen then? Well, uh, accounts certainly vary. Um, uh, according to um, Polybius, uh, Paulus was fighting with the cavalry, had seen a load of action there, and then seeing things not going so well in the centre, had moved to the centre to encourage uh, the men and, and spur them on, and also get stuck in with his sword, and that he fell in the fighting. Um, but Livy, Livy's far more spectacular. Um, Livy says that um, uh, Paulus was wounded uh, very early on by a sling, and uh, he staggered around the, uh, the, the battlefield heroically uh, with an escort of cavalrymen doing his best and fighting the enemy but getting weaker and weaker all the time until he, had, he was finally forced to stop and say, I, I'll have to just make my last stand here. Uh, and he, his uh, bodyguards dismounted with him and um, made a heroic last stand. And a tribune, a tribune came past and said, ah, here, look, uh, take my horse, go on, you, I can rescue you. Uh, you the, the, this is disaster for Rome, but you know, let's not make it any worse by having a consul die as well. And, and Paulus saying, no, no, you go on, I, I, I will die with my men, blah, blah, blah. It's a, it's, a, it's a spectacular, dramatic scene, so dramatic that one starts to sort of doubt it, really. But, um, oh, while I was researching this, yes, uh, Vir, uh, what's his name now? Vir, Viriathus. Viriathus is listed in, on the Wikipedia page for Cannae as one of the commanders of the Carthaginian side. <sighs> Come on, Wikipedia, no. Um, Viriathus uh, is the historical name of a Spaniard who lived quite some while after uh, Cannae, resisting the Romans uh, trying to conquer more of Spain. But a poem written by someone called uh, Silius Italicus, and should we ever take seriously someone called Silius Italicus, I say not, uh, two centuries later, he wrote a poem in which uh, the commander of a suspiciously large number of the Spaniards, uh, two whole tribes, the, 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 the Lusitanians and the uh, some other lot, um, he got stuck into the battle and he, with his own sword, um, he slew uh, Servilius um, and then Paulus came along and met him and Paulus, with his own sword, avenged Servilius and, yeah, did that happen? Did it hell? No. And yet uh, Wikipedia has listed him as one of the commanders of the Carthaginians. No, come on, just, I'm, I'm going to go with no. I mean, of course I don't, I can't be 100% certain, but 99 point something, no. Um, anyway, um, what the heck was I talking about while well, I got uh, distracted by that? Oh yeah, so Paulus, is, uh, Paulus dies, um, but Varro gets away. Now, when Varro flees to Venusium, according to Polybius, it, this was shameful. It was a dis disgraceful retreat. Um, uh, yeah, he's really pouring on the, the, the disgrace and shame and the blame for this disaster on Varro uh, and not on, on his guy, uh, his best friend's uh, granddad and the patrician, because he wants to be in with the patricians, because they're the sort of people who buy histories for a start, and that's what he's writing. Now, if you recall, a lot of Roman soldiers had escaped the battle, mainly from the, the, the camps uh, that the Romans had built, and had made it to Canusium, and four of these were military tribunes, who found themselves now rather senior officers in comparison with all the other people around them, and they thought, well, we're I suppose we should be in charge then. Um, one of them was the, the son of Fabius, the dictator uh, from um, the year before, and another one was a certain Publius Cornelius Scipio. Now, Publius Cornelius Scipio is a very significant figure because he is the man who will finally defeat Hannibal at the Battle of Zama many years ahead of this. 
so if you're trying to um, tell a dramatic story, you might want to introduce your hero at some point. Now, his very first introduction to history was quite spectacular. That was at the Battle of Ticinus, when he, he rode in uh, to the rescue of his father, who was wounded. His father also called, rather confusingly, Publius Cornelius Scipio. And uh, that's a good way to enter history, and he was 16 at that point. So at this point he'd be about 19 years old. Uh, no, he'd been 17 before, sorry. Um, and uh, what happens now? Well, uh, he gets elected uh, as one of the two tribunes who will then take over command of this fugitive force uh, in Canusium. And uh, whilst they're still debating what to do in one room, in bursts a messenger and says, <gasps> breathlessly, in a house just over there, there, there's a, there are some uh, Roman officers who are, who are uh, colluding. Uh, they're colluding to make it to the coast, get a ship and uh, just take off, abandoning Rome and maybe set up shop with some foreign prince somewhere. Well, what does, what does Publius Cornelius Scipio, who will later become Scipio African, Afri Africanus, um, what does he do? Well, he snatches up his sword. I'll have none of this, he says, and he hastens over to that house, bursts in, finds the men mid-collude, and says, Right! I swear that I will undyingly do everything in my power to defend Rome, my nation, and if any of you here does not take the same oath, you will be the enemy of my sword. So, what do you say then, eh? You want some? And aghast, the men all took the oath, and the day was saved. So, um, this is uh, Scipio coming to the fore again. So now, whereas before he was a, a teenager saving his father, now he's uh, the hero saving Rome. He, you're setting your hero up for great things later on. So did this happen? I don't know. I mean, it's a good story, isn't it? It's, it's uh, reasonably easy... I don't know what that noise was. Um, it's reasonably easy to imagine that uh, something like that could have happened and maybe it involved um, Scipio, and maybe a lot of the credit of what other people did got shifted to him. It's easy to believe, for instance, that there were people thinking, that's it, we've got to go. Because Rome, at this point, was absolutely despairing. Despair Everything they'd thrown at Hannibal had just been annihilated. Their, their grip on their supremacy over Italy was now looking at untenable. Uh, surely the various people who were under their yoke, the Etruscans, the Samnites, that they relied on as allies uh, it, it, uh, to, to fight their wars for them, or at least half their wars for them, um, uh, th those, those people would start rebelling against them because Hannibal had said that he was there to, to liberate all the, the, uh, the allies of Rome for, from the subjugation of Rome. Um, so they thought, well, that's it. He's done it. He's now defeated pretty much everything out there. By the way, a couple of days after Cannae, there was another massive defeat. Remember I said earlier there was a, another army sent north as a, as a diversion? That got ambushed and annihilated as well. So upon uh, this enormous defeat of Cannae, there was another shocking defeat for the Romans. And Rome is described in the history books as just one load of processions, uh, of religious processions and prayers and wailing women. Uh, Fabius and others got a grip, the Senate got a grip, according to Polybius, uh, Polybius they, they, they kept their heads and did the right thing. Uh, Livy goes into much more detail saying that, uh, that public mourning was, was forbidden, that women were confined to indoors because so many of them were just wailing in the street, and we can't have that. And yes, all sorts of quite strict measures. Guards were placed at the gates of Rome to stop people leaving Rome, not the other way around, to stop people leaving Rome because they just thought, we've got to contain this panic. Um, uh, in fact, the, uh, Livy describes um, a most un-Roman act, which was the sacrifice in the centre of Rome, in the cattle market, uh, of um, two Gauls and two Greeks, uh, one man and one woman of each, uh, human sacrifice. Yeah, the, 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 the Romans had stooped to human sacrifice. Um, there was, uh, apparently coincident with this, uh, two Vestal virgins were discovered to have sinned, uh, you know, that sort of sin, with, 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 a, with a chap. Um, and uh, they caught at least one of the chaps involved and he was beaten to death. Uh, one of the Vestal virgins for her sin was buried alive, as was the custom, whereas the other one committed suicide. Such was her shame. And for Vestal virgin sins, that was, that was meant to bring all sorts of calamitously bad luck upon Rome. So, yeah, scapegoats, again, you might think, really. Um, so uh, Rome was gripped by a religious panic and a military panic. Um, they then, uh, in response to this, they raised four legions, possibly in a day, which is quite staggering. Um, 
Uh, but in order to do this, they had to uh, drop the age of recruitment a bit, relax. He didn't have to be 17 anymore. He just had to sort of look, you, you know, big enough to hold a sword. And they even uh, they even armed 8,000 slaves. They raised a force of 8,000 slaves and put swords into their hands. Was that a good idea? Well, I, you know, possibly not. But they were so desperate, so desperate that they started arming slaves. The Romans. Think about that. That's a sign of tremendous desperation. Um, and so what did Hannibal do? Did he immediately march on Rome and take Rome and then score the ultimate victory, the defeat of the enemy? No, he didn't. And uh, Livy said that uh, you know, he, he could have and should have taken Rome and that, that that slight hesitation of not immediately attacking Rome was uh, what saved Rome and ultimately, therefore, the empire. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm really not convinced of this. Uh, one, I don't think that it was ever Hannibal's intention to take Rome. Two, had he tried it, I don't think he would have succeeded. There was still, uh, it was still possible for Romans to, to put armies out in the field. There were, there were uh, legions in Spain. There were, there were loads of uh, uh, forces that could be mustered to hit him from behind. Because as soon as he goes to Rome, which is a hell of a tough nut, tough nut to crack, it was very well fortified and had an awful lot of people in it, literally millions of people in it, and uh, if he was going to try to take the whole of Rome, how would he do it? How would he, he had no siege equipment. Um, and uh, as soon as he immobilizes himself in front of Rome, he's thrown away his advantage. He's better at marching and maneuvering than the Romans. That's what he's good at. He's a, he's a, a field commander. As soon as he immobilizes his force trying to, um, to take Rome, then they can surround him. And then he really will starve, wither and die, and it really will be all over. I think that he was very shrewd not to march on Rome. Now Livy tells us that Mahabal uh, has a go at him like this. He said, come on, send me to Rome. I'll tell you what, the first the Romans will know that they've lost at Cannae is when I show up on a horse with loads of the Numidian cavalry saying, ha ha, what are you gonna do now then Romans? Come on, let's, let's, let's take this, this, this opportunity. Come on, what, what, are you, what are you throwing this away for? You know how to win a battle, but you don't know how to, how to use it once you've won it. But in fact, Hannibal really had scored a hell of a victory because things changed. You've got to remember that up until this point, he'd been campaigning on his own. He'd been get, getting no support from Carthage. He'd been running short of money the whole time. Yes, he got some uh, Gallic allies from the north, but he went south, beat the Romans again and again and again, and none of the Roman allies was defecting over to him. After Cannae, they did. Oh, yeah, in droves. Capua, the second biggest city in Italy, came over to the Carthaginian side. Tarento, uh, Tarentum, uh, came over to his side. Um, and, uh, and, and the Samnites, and the loads of people, they were, they were changing sides, coming over to him. So um, it was a huge success. And it went further than that. Uh, the king of Syracuse uh, joined uh, his side. And of course, Syracuse. Uh, sucked out sucked in many, many, many uh, Roman soldiers to, to deal with that in, in Sicily, Archimedes and all the rest of it. He also got an ally in, in the, the king of Macedon, uh, Philip V. Um, so he, got, he was getting international allies, international recognition. This guy can actually beat the Romans. So yes, let's, let's throw in our lot with him. So for that reason, uh, Hannibal, I say, did get a huge amount of, of benefit out of his victory at Cannae. What he wanted was an alliance against Rome, and that's what he got thanks to this battle. Now, um, how many men died? Uh, lots of different figures, none of which is c completely reliable, but they're in the region of, let's say, 50 to 70,000 Romans died on that day. Uh, and on the Carthaginian side, maybe... Uh, something like 4,000 uh, Gauls died, maybe 1,500 uh, of the uh, African and, and Spanish, um, and um, I forget how many cavalry, but not that many, a, couple, a few hundred cavalry, um, according to Polybius. So the Carthaginians had suffered very few casualties, the Romans had lost the biggest army they'd ever put in the field by miles. Um, they'd also lost so many of their senior, they'd lost both uh, the con, the, well, they'd lost um, another consul, Varro of course escaped, um, they'd lost uh, both the proconsuls, they lost a couple of kaistors, uh, they lost um, something like 29 out of 48 tribunes were killed, 
um, and they lost another 80 senators or men of equivalent rank to, to senators, ex-senators some of them were, were as well. Um, the, they, the leadership of Rome had, had been cut in half. And as for the population, well, how do I get across to you the, the scale of this? So if you're American, you probably think, oh, the bloody stain in American history, Battle of Gettysburg. Only 8,000 men were actually killed on that day. And the population of the USA at the time was about 32 million. So that's something like uh, 0.025% uh, of the American population were killed on that day. And don't forget, Americans were fighting on both sides. Um, if you're British, you probably think, ah, oh, the Somme, first day of the Somme, horrendous. Uh, 60,000 casualties, uh, over 19,000 men killed on the first day of the Somme. What a bloody day that was. Yeah, but that's nowhere near 70,000 in one day. And the British population at the time was, uh, uh, was um, oh, uh, for, I, I forget now, 40, 50 million, something like that. So if you, if you look at it in terms of uh, the, pop, the percentage of the population, that's 0.0. .0 four or five percent of the British population of the time. Um, about 58,000 Americans died in the Vietnam War, fighting over 19 years. Um, but that's 0.0004 percent of the American population at the time, which was 216 million. The, at the Battle of Cannae, Rome lost 2.15 percent of its population. Not 0, 0 something, 2.15% of its population. In 20 months, the war had killed about one-fifth of the adult male population of Rome. Every household knew someone who had died. Uh, had someone from it, probably, who had died. Almost every household. So the scale of the carnage uh, um, viewed from the Roman uh, perspective is just so much greater than the Somme or Gettysburg um, or the Vietnam War, so much more of a psychological trauma uh, because of the proportion of the people killed in one day. This was the Battle of Cannae.